how's everybody's day going so far? From the moment you got up this morning and your alarm clock went off, you got your smartphone out and you sent some messages, you read the news, and some of you came here by bus or train, yeah, you took the car. Imagine the amount of software you have been using doing that. We don't realize it, but we are surrounded by software and we use a lot of it in the daily tasks that we do. Sometimes this software doesn't work well and this can cause us irritation. Yeah, you install some application on your phone and it doesn't work and you're working behind your computer, your application crashes, and you lose a half day's work. And that makes us irritated. But sometimes when software doesn't work, it can cause lots of more than irritation. It can disrupt lives. It can disrupt our society. And let me give you an example of something that happened here in the Netherlands, the childcare benefit scandal, the Toeslagenaffaire. People's lives were disrupted. People lost their jobs. People lost their houses. And even children were placed out of their homes, away from their parents. And it's a, it's a very complex scandal. No, it has root causes in politics, human error, and too many complex taxation laws. But at the central component of this scandal, there is software, an algorithm an algorithm that was used to profile people. And it turned out that the algorithm was discriminating people that did not have the Dutch nationality. So what went wrong here? So investigations on this algorithm and similar algorithms showed that one of the causes was insufficient testing. And I read it in the newspaper the other day. Insufficient testing. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, testing. And now people that know me will think, oh yeah, well, what else is new? No, because I talk about testing all the time, and it's true. But that is because it surprises me so much that in a world where we are surrounded by software that can potentially disrupt our lives, we do not test well. And what surprises me more that some people do not even understand what testing exactly is. And this, this is strange because we test in our daily lives. Yeah, we test the food we eat. We test the clothes we wear and the wine we drink. And bigger engineering uh, constructs like bridges and building, imagine we would not test those. But all of a sudden, if it comes to software, this is different. So software testing has always been neglected in computer science curricula. Students don't like to test. Students think it's boring. Teachers do not want to do testing in their classes because they think they need to sacrifice more important topics. More important topics than testing? I don't know. If you Google for the definition of software testing, you will find many definitions that are different and wrong. Some definitions will say, with software testing, you can show that your software doesn't have any errors. But that's not true. You cannot do it with software testing. And then other definitions say, with software testing, you can show that your software functions correctly ac with, uh, according to the requirements. But you can also do not do that with testing. The only thing that you can do with testing is assess the quality of a software system. And then there's people that say, well, if you cannot show the correctness, then maybe you should not do testing, but you should do formal verification. But then this is defaming testing, as if it's not important. And as a consequence, companies don't test well or don't test at all. People don't understand what testing is. People think testing is pushing some buttons or um, clicking some checkboxes. We need a shift. Because consider the world where we live in, that we are surrounded by software that can disrupt our lives and we do not test well. We need to change that. So I've been, testing, uh, I've been teaching testing and programming for over 20 years. And during these years, I have observed my students and I have observed professionals. 
And together with my team, we try to figure out what is going on. Why are we in this situation with software testing? And it's our conclusion that we're teaching it wrong. We're teaching it using a paradigm based on rationalism, where we start from complete specifications. But we should go to a paradigm based on empiricism. And let me give you an example of what I mean. So imagine a patient comes to the doctor with a skin rash, saying to the doctor, I have this skin rash and I recently changed my skincare product. So in a paradigm based on rationalism, the dermatologist will think, okay, well, this skin rash is due to this new skincare product. So it will say to the patient, don't use this anymore, and it will prescribe some treatment. In a paradigm based on empiricism, the dermatologist will do a very thorough inspection of the rash, looking at the color, looking at the texture, and asking for any other additional symptoms, pain or itch. Then this dermatologist will not only rely on this visual inspection and not on the information that the patient gave, but he will do a patch test. That's where you apply some common allergies to the skin and see if there's an allergic reaction. And the dermatologist finds out that indeed this skin rash is due to an allergic reaction. But not due to the skincare product that the patient indicated, but due to, due to some other change they made in their daily routine. And this illustrates very well the situation we have with software testing. Because specifications that, that uh, contain the information about the expected outcomes of a system are most of the time incomplete, ambiguous, or simply wrong. And if we rely on those specifications and that information, we will make false assumptions. And these will unable us to make a good evaluation of the quality of a system. The patient already said there was a new skincare product. And the first dermatologist immediately thought that that must have been the cause. But if we dive deeper, we experiment, we explore, we ask questions, and we don't take anything for granted, then we get to the bottom of things. And that is testing. So let me show you another example that I do with my students. I show my students this little calculator and I tell them, what do you expect to happen if I type one plus one and then the equal sign? And my students look at me and they say, well, two? And I say, yeah, very good. What else do you expect? And then they look at me a little bit strange and they don't know what to say and then they ask me, is this going to be in the exam? And they say, of course, everything I tell you is going to be in the exam. But what do you expect more? And then they say, well, maybe it has binary mode. Yeah? And then one plus one is zero one. That's, yeah. Very good. What else do you expect? And then most of my students fall silent because, well, that's what they expect. And then I tell them, you assumed that it's on, because if it's not on, it will not show you this too. Also, you assume that it has batteries that are working, yeah, because it can be on, but if the batteries are empty, it will also not show too. And then I ask them, you say it's two, but where does it appear? Is it to the left? Is it to the right? Or is it in the center? And how is the two going to appear? Is it going to be line segmented notation? Or is it going to be continuous notation? Or is the whole sum going to be there? One plus one equals two. Or maybe it's 2.0. And how long do you expect for it to appear? Is this seconds, minutes, hours? Yeah, and then finally, to give them like a very uh, exaggerating example, I also tell them that they assume that if I press this equal sign on this device, it will not self-destruct in 10 seconds. So I do this exercise with my students to show how difficult it is to make complete specifications of a system. 
Because we make all kinds of assumptions. And we have all kinds of unspoken knowledge, tacit knowledge. All the things I told you about this calculator, you all know. Yet, we don't make it explicit. And that is why it is so difficult to get complete specifications of the expected outcomes of a system. And now, obviously, one plus one is easy. Uh, and this calculator is very simple. But the systems we use today are far more complex because they have components that are based on AI, artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence can do amazing things. Yeah? We've seen it the past year. But s for many of these systems, we do not really know how they make their decisions. Yeah, for example, an autonomous car. It hits a pedestrian, while we would expect it to hit the brakes. We cannot really go into the system and trace the deductions that this system made in order to come up with this decision. And this is known as the black box problem. The artificial intelligence systems are black boxes. So if we don't understand something as unpredictable as artificial intelligence, how can we trust it? And how do we test it? Because I already indicated you with the example of my students that it's very difficult to get a complete specification of this simple system. Yeah? So these simple traditional systems, they need to be tested with a paradigm based on empiricism. But artificial intelligence systems, they demand to be tested with empiricism because it is impossible to make complete specifications of the expected outcome of the system. And that's because there's a whole new dimension of quality car characteristics that comes with AI. Explainability, responsibility, predictability, intelligence, morality, and all kinds of ethical concerns. And it's impossible to write these down in clear cut, complete specifications, because for some of these, we don't even know yet what it means. There's more. Because testing AI systems is far more complex than testing traditional systems. Because the AI systems are only as good, the outputs of the AI systems are only as good as the data that we train it on. Yeah, this is called garbage in, garbage out. So we should also test the data that these algorithms were, were, were trained on. But if we use these systems and we ask questions, and then what we do, we create a context for the system. And our questions and our prompts can contain a context that uh, generates different outputs. So it's not about an input-output relation anymore. It's input plus a whole different context that we can create for the system. So if we want to use these systems yeah, to make judgment about people, yeah, like the childcare benefit scandal I explained to you, then what we need is a human in the loop. A human in the loop that tests the output of the AI system and assesses this output for the quality. And you guessed it. We need a tester in the loop. We need a critical tester that explores, investigates, experiments, asks questions, thinks out of the loop, and does not take anything for granted. Currently, we are not educating our students like that. And that is why we need this shift in education. And not only in education at universities or in computer science, we need this in all levels of education because we are all going to be users of AI systems. And so we all need to become critical and testers. Thank you.